occasion when Jesus was going to the house of the leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you're invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place, and then in disgrace you will start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, thinking that they will invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed, because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
and some of the things that he said. One time during a game, a bunch of streakers ran across the field. Yogi was later asked, were they men or were they women? Yogi said, I have no idea. They all had bags over their heads. <laughs> On one occasion, when the Yankees flew to California for a game, Southern California, he quipped, boy, it, it sure gets late out here early. <laughs> And when someone asked about all the empty seats at the game, he said, well, if people don't want to come out to the ballpark, nobody's going to stop them. <laughs> Even when Yogi misspoke, what he said usually made some sense. He was once playing a baseball game on an extremely hot and muggy day in New York. His teammates were bitterly complaining about the miserable conditions, how it was too hot and humid even to play baseball. Well, after hearing all the complaining, Yogi offered his perspective on things. He said, you know, fellas, it's not the heat that gets you, it's the humility. <laughs> of course, Yogi meant humidity, but then again, did he? He never really knew with Yogi. Whether he intended to say humidity or humility, it's hard to disagree with what he said. Humility, humility is very difficult. The late, great Winston Churchill was once asked, doesn't it thrill you to know that every time you give a speech, the hall is packed to overflowing? He answered, it's quite flattering, but whenever I feel that way, I always remember that if instead of making a political speech, I was being hanged, the crowd would be twice as big. <laughs> a little dose of humility is a good thing. Not only a good thing. But today's scripture readings tell us it's essential. It's a vitally important part of what it means to be a person of faith. In today's gospel story, Jesus tells this parable. By the way, do you know what the word parable means? Parable comes from a Greek word, para, balo. Balo is the Greek word for ball, to throw. And para means alongside. So para, balo, parable means alongside. When Jesus tells a parable, he throws something out alongside of people. So Jesus tells this parable about being invited to a wedding feast. In Jesus' time, it was customary to save the center seat at the table for the person who was the most honored guest. Now that might mean the person who was the most powerful, it could mean the person who was the wealthiest, it could mean the person who had the highest office. Whatever it might be, whoever was the most honored guest got that honored seat at the table. Now if someone more prominent would come along, then that person sitting in the spot at that point in time would have to move to a lesser spot. What Jesus said was that a person should choose the most humble place when you go into a dinner party at that, so you might be invited to a higher place later on, not demoted to a lower place. And what Jesus was giving was not so much a lesser lesson in manners or how to go to a dinner party, but he really was giving a lesson in how to receive true blessing. Most people in those days thought that blessing came when you went into the hall and you were invited to sit at a place of honor. That's when you get blessed. But Jesus turns that notion upside down and says, no, blessings come when you invite and welcome people who normally aren't even invited to come to the table. And after telling that story, Jesus then says, so watch out. Those who exalt themselves are going to be humble, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. In the second chapter of his letter to the Philippian Christians, St. Paul writes, Do nothing, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. He goes on to say, let each of you look not to your own interest, but the, to the interests of others. And then a little, a few, a little bit later in those same verses, he talks about the ultimate symbol of humility. He talks about how Jesus himself humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Not that we should go out and die on a cross like Jesus did, because somehow we think, oh, okay, that's going to prove that I'm a humble person. Humility and humbleness that's a quality that God desires and hopes and expects of us. 
And in a way, if you think about it, we do die little deaths daily. As we die, to use that word, for the sake of others, we put the well-being of other people ahead of our own well-being, as St. Paul said. C.S. Lewis put it this way. He said, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. And I really like that. Today, we simply remember that if we want to be faithful followers of Jesus, we must learn humility, or as Yogi would say, it ain't the need, fellas, it's the humility. Not that anyone is counting, probably none of you are, but today is exactly 429 days away from the next presidential election. 429 days. Now, I don't know about you, but does it already seem like we're in the season of politics? <laughs> Lately, it seems like we're in the season of <coughs> nasty politics. One candidate smears another, and then the candidate who's been smeared bites back at the other one, stretching the truth about that person or whatever. It goes back and forth and back and forth. It gets pretty ugly. <coughs> ugly names are thrown around, accusations are tossed back and forth. And I've decided, after watching that, fairly or unfairly, rightly or wrongly, I have decided this about politicians. They don't seem to possess a whole lot of humility. <laughs> if you're going to hold up an example of humility in a church sermon, it's probably not going to be politicians. Some may be, but not generally. And maybe that's because somehow they have a sense that to show humility is a sign of weakness, and voters won't vote for it. But look at Moses. The Old Testament book of Numbers Chapter 12, verse 3 says, Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth. And yet he was one of the greatest leaders of all time. He handled the rebelliousness of God's people. He had the courage to face the Pharaoh head on. He had spent 40 years of his life doing one of the toughest jobs in all of history. And all of that while being exceedingly humble. Maybe as Christians we need to be more like Moses and less like politicians, which means being less concerned about who is right and being more concerned about what is right. That is humility. And if it means appearing weak, then so be it. Again, the words of St. Paul, this time to the Christians at Corinth. I have learned to be content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and Calamities for the sake of Christ, for whenever I am weak, then I am strong. One of the greatest paradoxes of the Christian faith is that when we are weak, it's then that we are greatest in the eyes of God. Now, if you're not convinced yet that humility is a good thing, consider this. According to a recent article in Forbes magazine, those who are humble enjoy better health, they have a greater sense of life's purpose. They have longer lasting marriages. And they are described as being a whole lot more likable and easy to get along with. As I said, politicians seem to be fighting against each other more viciously than just about any time in history these days. Wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice if they could learn to be nice to each other? I want to end with a story about a United States senator from years ago. His name was John Cornelius Stennis. He was a senator from the state of Mississippi. For 41 years, he retired finally in 1989. To give you an idea of the kind of person that Mr. Stennis was, he, his nickname was Mr. Integrity. He was brilliant when it came to matters of national defense. In fact, he's currently given credit for being the father and the founder of the modern Navy one of our nation's uh, nuclear supercarriers, the USS Stennis, was named after him. Senator Stennis was as highly regarded, in, was so highly regarded in Washington that at one point in time he was third in line to be President of the United States. So the story is told about how one day, after a very busy and stressful day in Washington, D.C., Senator Stennis drove home, he parked his car, and walked up the sidewalk to his home. 
Out of nowhere, two thugs came out of the darkness, shot him twice, robbed him, and left him thinking he was dead. He wasn't. He was found. He was taken to the Walter Reed Hospital, and he spent the next seven hours, I think it was, on the operating table, teetering between life and death. A senator on the other side of the aisle was driving home when he heard about the shooting. That politician immediately turned his car around and he drove directly to the hospital, thinking, what can I do, what can I do? I want to do something, but I don't know what that is. When he got there, he found that the hospital operators were swamped, trying to keep up with all the incoming calls about <coughs> Senator Stennis. And yet there was one spot at the switchboard, one unattended spot. Without hesitation, the senator sat down and he went to work. Throughout that entire night, he answered calls about his colleague in the Senate. Finally, when the calls slowed down around noon the next day, so he spent the whole night there, the first half of the next day. He stood up, he stretched, he put his coat on, and he began to walk out the door. And as he was walking out the door, he didn't, never said anything, he just quietly walked out. One of the operators got up and said, thank you, I don't even know your name. Mark Hatfield, the man said. Happy to help out. Now, as many of you know, Mark Hatfield was one of Oregon's most famous senators. It was a very quiet story that really didn't make the news, but in a sense, it was huge. It was a huge story. Did a conservative Republican just do all that for a liberal Democrat? Really? Did he just spend the whole night doing a menial task for a political rival only to say in the end, I'm very happy to do it? Wouldn't it be nice if we could hear a few more stories like that from the days. The late George Bernard Shaw, who won a Nobel Prize for Literature, once said this, and he was so right. He said, churches must not only act out humility, but they must also learn it and teach it. As the people of God and as the people of Christ Lutheran Church, we are called, invited, and expected to live by a different standard. Today we remember how important it is to be humble, to let the needs and the joy of others be such a priority that we are glad and willing to inconvenience ourselves simply for the satisfaction of knowing that this is what gladdens own heart, this God's own heart. This is how blessing is. Even if it's something simple, practice being humble. I end by quoting Yogi Berra one more time because I can't help it. <laughs> Yogi said, love is the most important thing in the whole world. That might in fact be the truest thing Yogi ever said. And in the very next sentence, he said the second truest thing. He said, Baseball is pretty good too. <laughs> and that I say, Amen.